Good morning or good afternoon, depending upon the time that you're viewing this uh, video. We're so thankful that you tuned in to uh, our uh, message. And um, just to introduce myself for the new viewers, I'm Rob Redden. Happen to be the minister for the Grover Beach Church of Christ on the beautiful central coast of California. I want to begin a series with you on the Beatitudes found in Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Let me read this to you and then we'll begin uh, our message. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle or meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful. <clears throat> for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evils against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, we've heard that this is described as the Beatitudes, and that word simply means a state of utmost bliss. It's from the Latin word beatus, which means blessed or blessed, and the Greek word is makarios, and is rendered blessed or happy in Romans 14, 22, fortunate in Acts 26 and verse 2. The lexicographer Freiburg characterized this by just considering it a transcendent happiness or religiously joy, blessed, happy, and in a non-religious sense, fortunate or even lucky. Now, the purpose of this sermon on the Mount, from Matthew 5 through 7, is to present the true path of righteousness. You know, religion should be a source of blessing and not misery. But unfortunately, some people's religion causes them to have horrendous guilt and misery. I call that a dysfunctional faith. The Beatitudes help us to develop a proper attitude. That's why I like to call this the B attitudes. And this is a preamble actually to the whole sermon. There are nine Beatitudes or blesseds in this passage. And I want to examine them each week one each week. You know, some translations use happy in all the occurrences of the word blessed, but I must say from my studies, this is inadequate. We use happy in most instances to describe our physical or emotional well-being or state of mind. Now, the blessed state promised even includes being faithful during persecution. It's hard to say we are happy for the persecution. We may rejoice that we've been honored to be persecuted for the sake of righteousness, but not for our physical and emotional pain, which may deeply affect us by that harm. Now, in classical Greek, such as Plato, the word was used largely of outward pro uh, prosperity, but the Greek Old Testament, translated a couple centuries before Christ, was used primarily of moral character. And the New Testament ennobled uh, it even more. Now, 
nothing demonstrates this as well as the Beatitudes. So let's explore the first one. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So here we see that this favored state of the believer is because one is poor in spirit. Notice he does not say here, blessed are the poor. And don't misunderstand me, please. People in poverty can catch some happiness. We can see little children living in poverty, having fun, playing with other children in the street. We can also see poor adults enjoying the company of one another. But unfortunately, there is so much sadness and often more sadness than joy living in poverty. You know, the word poor here suggests the need of help to survive. The, the word is used in classical Greek of one who crouches or cringes, a beggar. One is reduced to begging for alms. Even in instances in the New Testament, it still retains this meaning. Luke 16, 20 and 22, Lazarus is described as this crippled beggar at the gate of a rich man longing for the crumbs from his table, indicating that he is a beggar by the word poor. And it is so rendered in the New International Version. So the core meaning is to be in want and in need of assistance. To be poor in spirit is to be spiritually impoverished. This cannot be found in self-righteous people like many of the Pharisees of Jesus' day. When you must beg or die, you lose all sense of pride. You feel humbled. And Jesus is using an analogy from a too often seen beggar on the streets of the cities of Palestine and witnessed today in almost every city across the land. Now, Jesus will return to this analogy in the fourth beatitude in verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be satisfied. You know, the metaphor of a beggar is vivid for our spiritual concerns. When you think of a beggar, you think about his appearance. Worn out, filthy clothes, dirty body, unkept, very few possessions. What about our righteousness? In Isaiah 64, 6, Isaiah declares, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteousness De righteous deeds are like a filthy garment and all of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Can you compare spiritually our sight before God with that of a beggar on the street, homeless, in poor health, in misery? You know, when Isaiah caught a vision of the Lord sitting on his throne, Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 6 and verse 1 following, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The more we know about God, the more 
we feel like Isaiah. When we realize the holy majesty of the supreme creator of the universe, we sense our own worthlessness, we sense our own sinfulness, and we sense the distance between us and God because of our sin. You know, in the 1500s, John Bradford was a preacher and martyr under Queen Mary I. One day he saw a criminal on his way to be executed. And he stated, There but the, by the grace of God goeth John Bradford. You've heard it said, There but by the grace of God goeth I. Little did he know that sometime afterwards, he too would be burned at the stake for preaching his faith on trumped up charges of stirring up a mob. But he knew what poor in spirit meant. He owed everything to the grace of God. You know, a similar declaration is found in the writings of Paul. And I think about 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 8. When he listed a number of the witnesses of Jesus' resurrection, he finally came to himself. And he said in verse 8, Last of all, as of one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. Paul never forgot what he owed to the Lord for his salvation and how worthless his life was without him. He realized that nothing is worth keeping if we don't have Christ. As a matter of fact, he said nothing is worth anything but Christ. In Philippians 3, 8, and 9, he says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own based on the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends upon faith. That's what poor in the spirit really means. Now, Jesus is not addressing esteem as we think of it. He's not suggesting that one with, so, with low self-esteem is blessed. One can have a healthy self-esteem and still be poor in spirit. Much of our self-worth is developed in the home, in our childhood. When one is highly motivated to succeed and perfects his craft, he has a self-worth, unless failure in other areas of his life dominates. Pharisees were very successful, but their issues were egocentric. They measured others by their own yardstick. They judged others for not being like them. And they did not believe anybody could be like them. Their pride and egotism kept them out of the kingdom of heaven, and it will us too. You know, a person who thinks he's the center of the universe thinks only about how things will enhance himself and bring happiness to himself. Spiritually, these people are satisfied where they are. They don't listen to those who are more knowledgeable of God's word and much wiser for counsel. You know, poverty-stricken people need help. And one reaches a point when one gives up pride to survive. Those who are poor in spirit need help to admit it. They need God. They need spiritual guidance. They need spiritual fellowship. They cannot survive without these. And they realize that without God, they have nothing. And they will die spiritually. You know, 
I have found that some people fear asking questions for fear their questions may seem stupid. But let me tell you, there are no stupid questions regardless of who is asking, whether it's a child or someone who is even mentally ill. People who are poor in spirit want help spiritually. They do not live in a vacuum. And they will find the source to fulfill their spiritual needs. And their favorite song is not, I did it my way, but I want to do it the Lord's way because I cannot do anything else. You know, even homeless people crave fellowship, other human beings. But among them, suspicion is a controlling emotion. They have so little, and they fear someone will take the little they have. The poor in spirit want Christian fellowship. They're motivated and strengthened by being with those of like faith. You know, there's strength in numbers. And when God created man, he created woman because it wasn't good for man to be alone. In Ecclesiastes, we find that the wise man in chapter 4 said it this way. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. You know, I heard someone say one time, it's when the banana leaves the bunch that it gets skinned. Well, Christians who are poor in spirit value the strength that comes from Christian fellowship in worship and in social gatherings and in friendship with one another. Christian fellowships help strengthen one another. Did you know the word together is used over 300 times in various settings and circumstances? But the use regarding Christian fellowship is very important. In Romans 15, 5, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you may be with one voice, that you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another in Christ, as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Isn't that beautiful? The importance of Christian fellowship and worship and in play, in labor. The relationships of Christians are vital for our spiritual survival. In chapter 15 in Romans, also in verse 30, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Even the mighty Apostle Paul recognized his own inadequacies and his own needs, and he asks others to pray for him. Strive together with me in your prayers. I think it's interesting that the word strive here in the Greek is a source of our English word, agonize. Now, I don't mean that that Greek word meant agonize then, but I'm just saying that it's kind of interesting because it does give us a little insight into the depth of the meaning of strive, does it not? In Colossians 2 and verse 1, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all those who have not seen me face to face that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. There's that word together again, being knit together in love. You can't be a freelance Christian. 
when you read this. You know, also, the poor in spirit can truly have the greatest riches. In Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. In 3.16 of Ephesians, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in the inner being. God is the source of all strength and power, and he will splurge that on us through his glorious riches. 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that we through his poverty might become rich. Isn't that just amazing what God has done for us to enrich us? But only the poor in spirit will experience that. The poor in spirit will inherit the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. They are heirs with Christ. In Romans 8, 16, the spirit testifies himself with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs, also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if we suffer with him, we'll also be glorified with him. In Titus 3, 7, the New Living Translation, he declared us not guilty because of his great kindness. And now we know that we shall inherit eternal life. James 2, 5, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor to be in the world to be rich in faith and the heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those that love him? You know, my good friend and fellow preacher of the gospel, Dr. Ken Wilson, wrote a fine book called The Holiness Principle. It, too, is on the Beatitudes. And he wrote this, In humility, the poor in spirit have taken self from the throne of their hearts and have let Christ reign there forever. They gave themselves over to him with a contrite and reverent heart. The person that promotes submission will reject self. You know, poor in spirit comes down to accepting ourselves as we are. Have we come to the place where we feel accepted by God when we feel unacceptable to ourselves? We must recognize that we are not what God created us to be, and we can struggle to trick ourselves into denying the truth of our lostness with God. We are too poor to buy God's blessings by our efforts, regardless how religious we think we are. We sing just as I am, and it speaks volumes to those who know what it means to be poor in spirit. If we do not sense the poverty of our soul, we will never seek the true riches awaiting those who do. True riches are not things, but in relationships, and especially our relationship with the Lord. He only will feel that emptiness that sin has created. Only the Lord will array us with the garment of his righteousness. As Paul says in Galatians 3.27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Have you done this? Have you sensed the poverty of your spirit and reached for assistance to discover the true riches? I urge you to turn to the Lord in repentance and confess his lordship and be immersed so that your sins may be forgiven. And as Peter says, then seasons of refreshing will come to you from the presence of the Lord. Acts 3.19. Let us pray. Father God, see in us a poor, poor spirit, that we are poor in spirit. We bring nothing but our submission to your will. We have nothing to give you but our willingness to be your servant. Remove any pride that keeps us from humbly accepting your will. Make us your servants and cleanse us by the blood of your Son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, I want to thank you for tuning in and listening to this message. 
And again, I would urge you to join together with the saints, God's children, hopefully your church family, and worship the Lord on this Lord's day. This is the Lord's will. And once again, those who are poor in spirit will submit themselves to the Lord's will. Now, may you have a wonderful day and God bless you is my prayer. Goodbye.